I hope you enjoyed that sec uh, segment on YouTube. Uh, there is that uh, video of the, which is a summary of the book, The Prize, on YouTube. There's about, it's about eight hours in total, I think. I think there's about eight segments. But it's fascinating reading to learn about the early days and the development of the oil industry into the 1960s and the like. So great resource if you want to take the time to view it. The Black Giant was significant for several reasons. One is it solidified this idea of the rule of capture, which meant if you drilled a well, uh, you were able to capture the oil when it came to the surface. Basically, nobody has ownership below the surface. You take ownership at the surface. And I'm not a lawyer, so, so the lawyers would cringe at that. But that's why you saw all those rigs packed in so tightly together is because <clears throat> people wanted to try to get their oil out from underneath their ground before, before somebody else took it away. But also, you see the rise of the Texas Railroad Commission as a legislator in the Texas oil and gas industry. That uh, extends to today. Uh, so you, you, it's still called the Railroad Commission, and it was just available for them to step in and provide some sort of regulatory relief. You're going to see when we get into the leasing classes, there are still guidelines about how close to lease boundaries you can operate wells, and it's an outgrowth of this idea of the rule of capture and the Railroad Commission becoming the controlling body. Very importantly, you saw the idea of pro rationing. This idea of oversupply is ruining us, and so we need to uh, control, put some external control because these people cannot control themselves. That did continue throughout the, the uh, legacy of the Railroad Commission until production in Texas started to decline in the uh, 1970s, and it continued on. What was interesting is in the 2020 oil crisis right as COVID kicked off and demand plummeted, and we'll see that in a few slides later, there were a few people that called on the Railroad Commission to reinstitute pro-rationing to basically say you can only ship so much oil. And then lastly, the idea of pipelines. They talked about how much uh, oil that the Black Giant provided for the war effort, and that was in part because they started to build modern pipelines that were able to move the oil long distance. Mm -hmm. Another topic we're not going to talk about more in class, but it's important from a historical perspective, is the idea of the Seven Sisters. These were seven oil companies that really developed oil around the world. Again, many of these names are familiar to you <clears throat> because these oil companies still exist. And the way it worked as oil was discovered around the world was typically it was one of the Seven Sisters that were discovering the oil and they would approach the government and say, we'll give you X percent of the profits of this if you'll give us the right to develop the oil in your country. And over time, as the years went on, the countries began to demand, demand greater and greater and greater and greater cuts of that. Initially, it started out 10 to 20 percent, and then later on, they were wanting to get well over 50 percent. But you can see the various places around the world that oil was discovered. You can see in the Middle East, uh, it was discovered in the 1930s, just like the Black Giant was discovered. And then interestingly, the North Sea and um, the North Slope of Alaska were in the 1960s as they were starting to look for oil in new places. But again, it was these seven sisters that played a role in developing these uh, oil reserves. And what you see is over time, the Seven Sisters were pushed into minority roles by many of the national oil companies that we'll look at later. If the Railroad Commission was the one that was controlling Texas oil uh, from the 1930s to the 1970s with its pro-rationing, the organization called OPEC is who stepped into this on a global perspective. And so OPEC is almost as old as I am. It was born a year later than I was. And it was by those companies, I'm sorry, by those countries who were basically trying to get rid of the influence of the Seven Sisters and their ability to control their production of oil and say, we want to have that for itself, for ourselves. And so OPEC in the 1960s began to grow in importance, and we're going to see they became really important in the 1970s and going forward. It's how much how, how important it is today is an interesting topic of discussion. We hear a lot of discussions today of OPEC plus. Who is that? Well, OPEC plus are these countries 
who are the OPEC members, plus Russia. And uh, you're going to see on some later uh, charts and then some discussions that Rus Russia is one of the top three oil producers in the world, Saudi Arabia being another one of the top three, with the United States being the third. Those are the three major producers in the world. So uh, it behooves OPEC to try to get Russia involved. It is a very uneasy alliance, and we'll talk about that some a little bit later on when we look at the impact of uh, 2020 and going forward. In terms of the oil reserves that OPEC controls, they are immense. They control 80% of the world's oil reserves. Now, you have to make sure you understand what that concept means and also what's economic oil and what's not. And again, that's a conversation that we will expand on in class, but OPEC is tremendously important, and they are a mechanism where people try to exert control over the supply of oil. The demand is the demand. Just like pro rationing tried to reduce the supply of oil, OPEC is involved in modulating the supply of oil to try to match demand. <clears throat> the last concept I wanted to introduce to you in this video is the fact that not all oil is created equal. There are two important attributes, and there are more than two, but these are the two that you will typically hear, and that is, is it sour or sweet? And this has to do with the impurities that are involved in the oil. Often it's sulfur, um, but it could be other impurities as well. Sweet oil requires less refining, therefore it's more valuable. Sour or Sour oil requires more refining processes and can't produce quite the high value cut of uh, products, and so it is less valuable. Likewise, you hear heavy and light, and the light is the higher quality oil. The easiest way to, to remember this is uh, the lighter the oil, the, heavy, the, the greater its cut of gasoline, with gasoline being kind of the top value-added product, with, uh, and we'll see what, what comes out of refineries in our discussion a, a little bit later. So light, sweet oil is the most valuable oil. It produces the highest cut of gasoline and it requires less refining to get to those high cuts. And you can see this is WTI, West Texas Intermediate, and Brent, which comes out of the North Sea. So these are the two most commonly cited price benchmarks in the global oil market. And notice that's important because they're basically equivalent kinds of oil. You would expect to pay less money for the oil over here and oil down here for that matter because they're not as valuable. By the same token, you would expect to pay more for oil that was up here because it's a little bit higher quality. In the next uh, group of slides, we're going to get into what determines the price of oil and how it's varied through time. Join me in the next video.